What do you look for in a church? Uh, in a local church, maybe some of you are, have been part of that process. Maybe you're part of that process right now. Uh, maybe uh, attending here this morning, maybe viewing uh, this sermon online and kind of looking at uh, uh, where, where should I go, what church should I attend, what are certain characteristics that are worth looking for. Uh, working uh, m- many years in, in student ministry, this is one thing we try to teach uh, our students of w- what to look for because likely you'll, you'll grow up, some will move from the area, get plugged into other local congregations, or what are some things to look for? We did not say when you're looking for a church, make sure you look for a church that's dead. Make sure that there's no life there at all. That would be wonderful for you, wonderful for your soul. Make sure you're a contributing member of a dead church, making sure that it is dead. No, that's not what we said. But when we look at Revelation 3, we do see that there's churches in this condition. And what are we to do? What are we to think about this? What, what, is there hope for this? Well, I love this letter to the church at Sardis because it, it, it does give us hope, but it also, with the instructions to this church, it also gives us instruction to revitalize parts that need to be revitalized. These are instructions not only for local congregations, but even for us as individuals to be aware of, to be sorting out in our own life. There's so much here for us to unpack, and I am excited to do it. God's Word is amazing, uh, and we get to look at it this morning. Uh, what, what a beautiful gift that God has given us. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis writes, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what hour I come against you. Yet there's still, I still, you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So good. So good. First thing that we notice here is reputation does not always align with reality. Reputation does not always align with reality. I know your works. You have a reputation of what? Being alive. But Jesus says, but that's not the truth. The truth is, you are dead. If we look at that little section itself, it's important to recognize how Jesus is described. In each of these letters, Jesus is described in a particular way given a particular emphasis for that letter and for that church. And once again, we have a description of Jesus in this passage. And he's described as one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. We've already seen how stars is reference to the angels, and each of these letters are addressed to angels. And Jesus is referring to his authority over the churches and over the messengers. But what is this idea of the spirits getting at? There's a lot of different perspectives here from planetary deities to angels. But many see this as an allusion to Isaiah 11, 
2 to 5, and Zechariah 4, 1 to 6. Speaking of the fullness of the Holy Spirit, I believe this is the best way to understand this. And even if I'm wrong, from other passages, we know that Jesus does possess the fullness of the Spirit. But it makes sense in this context as well. The church has a reputation of life, but they do not really have life. And which person of the Godhead is said to bring life? The Holy Spirit, according to John 6, 63. If you're here for our What We Believe About God series, in one sermon we described how some attributes are associated with specific persons within the Godhead. If you remember the fancy term for it, divine appropriations. Right? Divine appropriations. Some persons within the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have specific things that are attributed to them. But we also said that they cannot be truly separated since God is unified in all his works. And we see that at play here, don't we? Like theology matters. We're talking about these, these deep, abstract concepts. And yet we see that on display in how Jesus is described to the churches. Jesus says, I possess, I have the fullness of the Spirit. He has the fullness of the Spirit. Jesus in the unity of the Godhead is one in nature with the Spirit. It's through Him that the Spirit is sent to bring life. It, so it's through Jesus the Spirit is one that brings life, and they're claiming to have life, but they don't have life. And Jesus is saying, the only reason you would have life is if I sent the Spirit to you. That's how life is given. You can't fool the, the giver of life. Regardless of what you're saying, the fullness of the Spirit may also bring to mind that the Spirit is everywhere and searches all things, like we see in Psalm 139. This is one that the church can't fool, regardless of what they claim, regardless of what others might say about them. You see, Jesus calls it like it is. Jesus has the power to bring life through the Spirit, and he has wisdom to know the truth of a situation. Names and labels do not necessarily correspond with reality. Calling yourself something could be a vain attempt at trying to remake the world according to our liking. But since God does exist, he has a standard that is outside the subjective whims of any individual or even society. God's declarations align with how things truly are. As Jonathan Edwards once said, truth is the aligning of our ideas with the ideas of God. And here is the God-man, Jesus Christ, speaking and calling things like they are. It doesn't matter if you think you're alive. It doesn't matter if everyone else in your town thinks you're alive. The reality is, you're dead. I know because I have the fullness of the Spirit, the giver of life. This idea of resting on the reputation or thoughts of others would be very familiar in Sardis. This is a town that's very proud of its heritage, of who it was. In fact, it was situated at the western end of a famous highway from Susa through Asia Minor, and it was a city of wealth and fame. The jewelry found in the local cemeteries indicates great prosperity, one commentator writes. It was at Sardis that gold and silver coins were first struck, and it was claimed to be first to discover the art of dyeing wool. And so there's this legacy, there's this heritage of we are a great city. In fact, a city that competed. We want to be the, the home of the, the temple of the shrines to, to the imperial cult, and there's a competition that they were in. 
to say, who would get this and who would win this? And so they, they ended up losing out to, to, to Smyrna, but they had the reputation, well, we're in the hunt. This is who we are. They had uh, near destruction for a ter- terrible earthquake in AD 17, um, and they were in the process of, of rebuilding uh, to their former glory, of uh, looking back, and things were still incomplete. But they were a proud town. And so was the church, reflecting the society around them, proud. And yet their pride, their claims did not align with reality. So what is needed in the midst of this? If there's this church that thinks they're alive, but yet they're dead, like, is there hope in the midst of this? Yes. See, a a dying church needs revitalization. Like, why write to a dead church? What's the purpose? Uh, We should be encouraged that this letter even exists. There's there's hope for dying churches. There's hope for those who are on the decline. Why? Because Jesus loves to make beautiful what sin has made ugly. He loves to redeem what Satan has tried to destroy. He loves to bring life from death. Over and over again, throughout the biblical narrative, we see situations that appear hopeless. And instead, they become monuments of God's redeeming grace. And I'm encouraged right now that there's a lot of work being done to revitalize churches. There are a lot of books that are being written to take, about steps to take, even seminary degrees dedicated to church revitalization. I love it. In the past couple decades, there's been a a big focus on church planting, something that's needed, something that's healthy, but sometimes that could be pitted against kind of the established church. Remember one uh, church planting professor even said jokingly, uh, it's easier to have babies than raise the dead. But isn't God in the raising the dead business? Shouldn't we long for both? Further, can it be a little cavalier about those who struggle with childbirth? Something that Scripture also addresses and shows that God's power can be there in the midst of that as well? Both planting and revitalization are utterly dependent upon God to be at work. This is where revitalization might have the upper hand in many ways. It can be really easy to depend on your own giftedness, your own entrepreneurial spirit in planting where you go into a church that is on the decline and you're utterly aware God needs to be at work here. But both need the grace of God. And as we look at this church, a church that is on the decline, Labeled as spiritually dead, Jesus gives commands. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I didn't command something that's dead. Because Jesus has the power to bring life in the midst of it as well. And so these commands are instructive for us, the five commands to this dying church that are instructive for them, but I think instructive really for us as well as we think of how do we be faithful. First, be watchful. Be watchful. It's this idea of wake up, be alert, be attentive. It's that idea of attentiveness, of always being on the watch. Wake up. Drink your coffee. Not decaf. Well, I, okay, quick aside. <clears throat> At the uh, previous ministry, uh, we, we like to joke that we, we, we like our coffee here like, we th- like our theology, strong and undiluted, right? Um, 
<clears throat> and so uh, there, there's something to a, a good cup uh, of coffee that, that, that's not theological. That's, that's, just, just, that's just an aside. Um, but we, we will take steps to have uh, better and better coffee here to, ma- to match, uh, to match the, the, uh, um, what, what we're preaching. But this idea of, of being watchful does remind me of kind of our recent visit to Michigan. Uh, we just came back from uh, a visit to, uh, to, to Michigan uh, this, this past week, visiting family there. And it seemed like everywhere we went, we almost had a near car deer accident. They're everywhere. So uh, driving down the road, not only do you, see, do you see eyes in the field, but you also see deer coming towards you. It's like they're on a mission to prove that they're there and they have the right of way. In fact, the, 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 the county that we were uh, right, right near, it was, it was the largest kind of car deer accidents uh, within the state uh, year to year. It's like they're, it's, it's a running thing. Just very proud of that title. And, and so uh, we were very aware of that. And they were everywhere. And it's something that if, if I'm going through Bullsburg or State College, yes, there's, there's deer around, but you don't have to be quite as alert to when they're jumping out just to prove that they're there. And, and so throughout the, the course of that, there's just a, an increased alertness, awareness of everybody be watching, looking out the windows. Do you see eyes? Do you see any? Like, be careful here. Because this could happen at any moment. It, it seems like this kind of alertness, this kind of watchfulness was lost at the church of Sardis. They had grown comfortable it appears. Perhaps they didn't have false teaching going around like some of the other churches. Maybe they weren't facing the same level of physical persecution, but they may have just gotten comfortable in the culture they lived and lost their distinctiveness. They may have rested on their past vitality instead of pursuing Christ passionately themselves. There are a lot of unknowns. But again, this would correspond with the culture they lived in. Sardis was known for being a city that thought itself impenetrable. Nobody can attack them. Its walls could not be taken, they thought. And twice in its history, it was taken by surprise. These accounts are recorded. In one historical record of the attacks, it says how a soldier um, in uh, in Antiochus' army found a place in the wall of Sardis that was altogether unguarded because of the extreme precipice near it. While the army mounted an attack at the gate of the city, this soldier and his comrades mounted ladders at the unguarded point, entered the city, and opened the gates for the army of Antiochus. We're not even going to post a guard there because we know nobody can scale this. Uh, Jim Hamilton summarizes it like this. Sardis was a place known for being twice captured at precisely the place where supposed strength of the city due to the imposing precipice made the besieged forces so confident that no guards were even posted. Twice. Like, it's not even post guards because we're, we're strong, we're fine. This is what's happening in the city, and it seems like this kind of mentality as, is part of the church as well. We can be so confident, surely not us, that it leaves us defenseless. It reminds me of something that D.A. Carson once said. He says, one generation believes something, the next assumes it, and the third will forget and deny it. One generation believes something, the next assumes it, and the third will forget and deny it. In extended reflection on this, Carson writes this, In a fair bit of Western evangelicalism, there is a worrying tendency to focus on the peripheral. My colleague, Dr. Paul Hybert, springs from the Mennonite stock and analyzes his heritage in a fashion that he himself would acknowledge as something of a simplistic caricature. 
but useful one nonetheless. One generation of Mennonites believed the gospel and held that there were certain social, economic, and political entailments. The next generation assumed the gospel, but identified with the entailments. The following generation denied the gospel. The entailments became everything. Assuming this sort of scheme for evangelicalism, one suspects the large swaths of the movement are lodged in the second step, with some drifting towards the third. What is it in the Christian faith that excites you? Today, there are endless subgroups of confessing Christians who invest an enormous amount of time and energy in one issue or another. Abortion, pornography, homeschooling, women's ordination for or against, economic justice, a certain style of worship, the defense of a particular Bible version, and countries have a full agenda of urgent peripheral demands. Not for a moment am I suggesting that we would not think about such matters or throw our weight behind some of them. But when such matters devour most of our time and passion, each of us must ask, in what fashion am I confessing the centrality of the gospel? What is it in the Christian faith that excites you? In what fashion are you confessing the centrality of the gospel? You see, so many things flow from the gospel. There are implications. We should pursue them. We should do these things because of what Christ has done, because of who we are now in Christ. But if those things become central, we lose everything. So often we can be divided, we can be clamoring, we can put up as something maybe super important, but if we make it primary when it's not primary, it can never hold that weight. It can shape our loves. It can redirect our heart. What is it in the Christian faith that excites you? Remember the Apostle Paul, I count everything as a loss except for knowing Jesus, except for the cross of Christ. So the first command is to be watchful. The second is to strengthen what remains. The church still has embers of God's grace that can be fanned into flame. They're not completely dead. Dead is referring to their condition apart from repentance, apart from restoration. Similar to when the prodigal son was referred to as, as, as a son who was dead in Luke 15, 24, but was restored with his repentance and with his return. So this church is in need of revitalization. Their works are not pleasing to God. As one commentator put it, they had grown content with a mediocre, halfway comfortable and convenient Christianity. Their faith was not radical, it was almost invisible. The lost among them who they lived, worked, and prayed saw nothing different or unique about them. The culture did not oppose them, it simply ignored them as of no real consequence or significance. They were so weak in their confession of Christ that they bothered no one. Like the unfinished temple in their city, they too were incomplete in what Christ saved them and called them to be. Strengthen what remains. This command not only for a church corporately, but for us individually as well. Strengthen what remains. What is God doing? The third, he says, remember what you have received and heard. Just like Ephesus, this church is called to remember. And here the idea is a continual call to remember. What are they to call to their mind? They're called to their mind which they had received and heard. And it's interesting here, there's a change in verb tense. They received indicates something ongoing. It corresponds with them receiving faith and abiding trust in Jesus Christ. How? Through that which they had heard. Something that took place before, at a point in time. What is this? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. It's nothing short of the gospel of Christ which brings spiritual life. 
What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's the good news. It's the good news that Paul said he received, same word, and passed on. That Christ died for our sins, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve. The gospel is the good news that Jesus came to save sinners through his life, death, and resurrection. Our sins earn us the just punishment of God, but Jesus came to live in our place and to take the punishment we deserve so that all who trust in him will be saved. He came to undo the brokenness that sin brought and to make all things new. And all who belong to him participate in the new life that he is bringing and showcase it to others as they live faithfully. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ to save you from your sins? If you haven't, stop right now. Wake up. Trust in Jesus and what he has done. Don't delay. You will stand before God one day, either in your sin or in Christ, who washes us white as snow. They're to remember what they see, received in her. Don't ever get bored of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, as Paul said in Romans 1. Also, keep it. Keep it. It's important because we tend to drift towards complacency. We tend to drift towards forgetting. We tend to drift toward thinking we are good with God, not because of what He has done for us in Christ, but because of what we do. Like the hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. In Michigan, we, were, we went uh, paddle boarding along uh, the, the, the lake, and we were going in one direction, which was really nice, and we're going fast. On the way back, not so much. The wind was kind of picking up a little bit, and, and so on the way back, you really ha- we really had to, to go hard. If not, I would stand there and act as a sail on the board and just fly in the other direction. Without actively paddling, I'm going in the other direction. If we are to keep what we received and heard, we have to actively paddle, right? It's an active thing. If not, we're simply drifting along with the currents of the culture. Drifting. Nobody drifts in the right direction. It takes the grace of God. It's interesting with this song, Prone to Wander, Lord, I Feel It, Prone to Leave the God I Love. The song is right in this condition because it asks for God's grace to bind their heart to him and to seal them. And how does God do this? How does he seal us? He seals us by his word through the Spirit. As the Spirit accompanies the word and presses home the truth to us and changes us and shapes us as they said, they're, they're, the works are, 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 are not good. They're incomplete. But how does God make us complete? Right. The word of God was given so the man may be complete, thoroughly, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17. Summarize. That's not a direct quote. What else do they need to do in this? They're also to repent. Maybe. We see the last command is to repent. Repentance isn't a one-time event in the life of the Christian. It's the characteristic of what it means to be a Christian. Repentance includes a change of mind and attitude in relation to sin. God does not merely save us from the consequences of sin. He saves us from sin, from its power, from its reign, 
The Christian is one who is transformed by grace from death enslaved to sin to being alive in the goodness of God's purposes. Don't grow cold in the grace of repentance. Don't think that you've moved beyond it. Now, Jesus warns them he's coming. In the purpose and the plan of God, there, there's always hope for those who truly repent, but we don't know how long that hope will last. And here Jesus uses the imagery of a thief, of someone sneaking in at night. Someone sneaking in at night. Like, this is not a good sneaking in at night. This is not Santa Claus sneaking in at night. Let's leave him some cookies and he'll leave us some gifts. No. This is a, a troublesome thing. But what's interesting is that this is not a thief coming to take what is not theirs. This is the God of the universe coming to make a claim on those things which are his. This is a God acting in justice. He will come like a thief in the night. Sometimes this refers to a specific point. Scripture uses this language elsewhere when Jesus will return in the last days associating with kind of his second coming. But here, It is the specific application for the church. Jesus is coming for judgment against the church. They must repent. He will not tolerate their sin any longer. And this is a challenge for us today, both individually and corporately. What are sins that you must repent of? Are you harboring sin in your life? Are you failing to truly turn from it and give it to the Lord? Don't delay. If there is no eagerness to turn from it, if it doesn't keep you up, that's a problem. It should bother us if sin doesn't bother us. God's grace isn't the opposite of holiness, it's the way that holiness is pursued by sinful people like you and me. Second, we might ask, what are things that we need to repent of corporately? Maybe this is us as a local church. Maybe it's the church in the United States or the universal church at large. What are things that we need to turn from? It bothers me when some say there's no hope for a church in America or we should just blow it up and start over. That's not what we see in this letter. We see Jesus calling the church to repent, to turn back, and throughout the history of the church, there have been reformations that have sought to turn from perversions in the church and to faithfully pursue Christ. And God has used these over and over again. The goal is not to blow up and start over. That places the ability on us as if the church were just a business venture. Let's not waste any more capital in that failed pursuit. No. Jesus died for his church. She is worth loving and caring for. Let's be quick to pray for God's grace to heal her. Third, those who are faithful are recognized. See Jesus commanding these things of, of turn, but that's not all that we see. We do see that there's still a few names, verse 4 in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. There's some faithful ones in him. And there's this contrast between the collective whole and a small number of godly Christians whose names kind of devote, denote individual people. Their, their conduct is, is not taking away the purity and godliness given to them by Christ's work. But they're keeping in step with the gospel. And they're to be rewarded with clothes because of what Jesus has already done for them. It's not based on their effort, but on the finished work of Christ that they're trusting in. As Revelation 7.14 says at the end, they have washed their robes and made them white. How? In their works? In their effort? No, in the blood of Christ. And Christ's work provides the objective grounds for our cleansing and for our right relationship with him. And we see in this passage that they're walking with Jesus in white. This refers to the holiness. and is a magnificent picture. It points us back to the garden. Remember back when people used to walk with God? How did they walk with God? Because they were holy. They were blameless. They didn't have sin, but then when they did sin, they needed clothes to cover them from their shame. But there was still a distance. 
And now we see them perfectly clothed and in right relationship, walking in holiness with the one who is holiness. Jesus makes all the wrong things right. He, he, he reverses that which is sad. He brings wholeness and restoration to alienation. Not because of our perfection, not because of their perfection, but because it was provided by the Lamb of God. And the faithful are not blotted out, but they're forever recorded. It is Jesus who provides salvation. It's him we trust. Yet there's always temptations to doubt our security in Christ. Perhaps it would have been easy for the Christians of this day, since those in the synagogues, many whom they had worshipped alongside previously, were now actively asking for them to be blotted out of the book of life. This is from a first century Jewish prayer to be read in the synagogue. This is this. For the renegades, let there be no hope. And may the arrogant kingdom soon be rooted out in our days. And may the Nazarenes, those who associate with the one of, from Nazareth, right? Jesus of Nazareth. Some of the Christians perish and be blotted out from the book of life. And with the righteous, may they not be inscribed. Active prayers against them. Blot them out. And what do we see here? I will never blot his name out. It doesn't matter our perception of spiritual life if we don't truly have it. So it doesn't matter those who claim we don't belong to Jesus when we really do belong to Jesus. People don't have the power to remove names from the book of life. These names are, as we see later in the book of Revelation, in chapter 17, verse 8, they were written in there before the foundation of the world. You can't blot them out. They're mine. How we need that. When times are difficult, when things are hard, uh, Jesus says, they're clothed in my perfection. You're not going to blot them out because they belong to me. You see, the one that we confess is the one who confesses us as well. Do you see that in the passage? We confess the name of Jesus and are saved. It's through trusting in his work to save us from our sins. But what's remarkable here is that those who truly belong, those who conquer, these are the names that Jesus confesses to the Father. We confess Jesus' name for our salvation, and he confesses our name. So many times we try to make a name for ourselves, we want to bring ourselves honor and glory, but the one who lives for Jesus will be vindicated. They will be honored. It's such a redemptive reversal. The ones who don't want praise but simply live for Jesus will end up being honored by Jesus before the Father, but the ones who desire the praise of others will get what they want. It should remind us of Matthew 10, 32. So everyone who acknowledges me before man, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. And the next verse gives a warning about those who deny Jesus, he will deny. Our service this morning involved a testimony from a brother in Christ who verbally professed his trust in Jesus for salvation. And this is one thing a gospel-believing church does. It recognizes these confessions and includes them among their number. That's church membership. It rem also removes those who deny Christ either by rejecting the faith in word or in unrepentant action. We may do this imperfectly, but it's meant to reflect the true and perfect reality. 
We confess one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and fellow members of this local body because Jesus confesses us as his own before the Father. (laughs) This is the privilege of local church. If you've never trusted in Christ, do so now. Don't delay. Today's the day Christ will come as the thief of the night. It says if you are, if you have trusted in Jesus and you're a part of this local church, praise God. If you have and you're not part of this church or any local church, we'd love for you to be a part of this body. We'd love for you to be part of this body formally. We don't have the ability to write you in and out of heaven. Only Jesus does. But being part of a local church helps us to reflect that heavenly reality in the here and now. It helps us to reflect what what Jesus is doing before the Father. And that's that's a sheer joy we get to have as we walk with the one who saved us. Uh, what, a, what a beautiful privilege. We'd love to talk to you about that. If you do not know Jesus, we'd love to talk to you about that as well. We'll have some people up front that would love to pray with you afterwards. If you have and you belong to him, rejoice that no one can blot you out if you truly belong and that Jesus is confessing you before the Father. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the beauty of this letter. And the Father, Left on our own, we are, we are prone to wander. We are prone to drift from, from life to death. And yet we ask of your sustaining grace in our life. Give us hearts of repentance. Give us vitality in this local body. Help us not to be a second or third generation that is losing the faith that's focusing on the sides. But Father, Renew our hearts. Help us to cling fast to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.